good evening and uh, thanks for coming. This is uh, the presentation of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory in Tupper Lake, New York. My name is Seth McGowan. I'm the president of the organization here. And we have um, a, a nice facility here. We're, we're working on uh, building more and you'll hear more about that in just a few minutes. But generally our goal is to make the universe accessible uh, for everyone. We, uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we believe that the wilderness does not believe, uh, does not end at the tree line, but the original wilderness actually came from stars, as, as you may have heard. We're all stardust. So we believe that you don't need to be an astrophysicist in order to uh, enjoy astronomy and be, feel like you're part of our universe. And that's, that's really what we're trying to accomplish through not only these lectures, but all of our programs. A lot of questions about in our observatory, why did we choose Tupper Lake? Well, let me show you why. Here is uh, the night, uh, the light pollution uh, on the East Coast, and you can see the outline for New York generally there and, uh, and Massachusetts and, and so forth. The Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is right in the middle of that dark uh, area. Uh, we have uh, great dark skies up here in Tupper Lake. And you'll notice along this perimeter, this is where all of the light pollution is, and we are kind of exempt from that. But our visitors come from Montreal, Toronto, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, New York is a big one, Boston is a big one, and they all come to us to enjoy those dark skies. And in particular, because we have the astronomy experts here uh, to help people enjoy their experience when they're at the observatory. So here are some of the things that we do. We do free public observing programs on Friday nights that are clear. And because it's been fairly cloudy for many of those Friday nights, we've taken to having free public observing programs pretty much any day of the week. Uh, if the sky is clear, we're gonna try to open and we're going to try to publicize that through Facebook, through email blasts on our website, through Twitter and Instagram. So if you're subscribed to any of those or you follow us on any of those platforms, you'll get notification if we're opening. And those can really happen at any time now. So the inside of the observatory is where we look through our telescopes. And here's a private party that we do, that we have also. You can rent an observatory and an astronomer for a night um, from us. So we do this. This is a birthday party for this uh, young gentleman and his parents. We do a tremendous amount of outreach to the local schools with our Star Lab Planetarium. Uh, this inside em emulates a real planetarium experience where the stars are projected above, and I get to talk to the kids about constellations and the movement of the sky and, and so forth. So we do a ton of these all the time, and uh, we'd be happy to talk to you if your school is interested in doing that as well. Additionally, um, we have the opportunity to talk to uh, students about uh, outside of the Star Lab also, here's a, uh, a STEM-related visit that uh, I did with our elementary school. Oftentimes, I'll be talking to high school physics classes or astronomy classes and just take their experience to the, uh, to the next level. We have our after-school programs. Here's a little workshop in telescope making we did a couple of years back. Uh, this little girl had a great experience that night looking at Saturn for the very first time through our telescope. So... Uh, these are after-school programs or summer programs we also do. One of our keystone events is our annual astrophotography conference that I mentioned. This is a fully immersive conference uh, where for four days, uh, for only $300, you spend the four days with us learning all that you need to know to move your skills to the next level in astrophotography. So whether you're a newbie at it or whether you're uh, an experienced astrophotographer, we can help you get to the next level. And you can see we have classroom time where we do uh, very uh, specific instruction on software right with you, right on your own computers, right with your own equipment. And then on the right there, you can see that's the sort of people setting up for an evening of image capture. And this is sort of a, a time-lapse of that same scene. Here are the, you know, people are sort of setting up their equipment 
And it, it, you can't see it here, but we have our astronomy team and our astrophotography team helping with everybody's equipment um, so that they, they can uh, troubleshoot problems that may come up. And in astrophotography, there are always problems that come up, especially when it's very cold out. So uh, we do this in, in October uh, that coincides with the new moon, the first new moon in, in that time. Here we are here tonight for our Cygnus lecture series. That is another program that reaches a, uh, a ton of people, uh, people from all over the country and, and the world. Um, it, it's become very popular. It started because of COVID. We did a lot of uh, lectures in person. We started doing them online and we'll continue to do them online, although I think we're going to try to do some in person uh, as well and, and very likely hybrid uh, in the future. So our future is kind of interesting in that we have our existing roll-off roof observatory for night viewing, but we are in the process of uh, building a planetarium. And you can see this is sort of a, a visualization of what that building would look like. Our existing property right now contains the, the roll-off roof observatory right there in the upper left-hand corner. And in the lower right-hand corner, that's where our planetarium is targeted to be. It not only is a planetarium, but there's a lecture hall, a multi-purpose lecture, classroom, art exhibit room. Um, and then on the left side of, this, of that, uh, you can see there's other places for flexible instruction. Uh, the planetarium will be a 33 foot uh, dome, 56 seat uh, planetarium, and it'll look something like this. That's the that's the idea. So that's all about fundraising for us right now, honestly. So if you're interested in being part of that planetarium fundraising project, um, I'll paste this link into our chat in just a little while. Um, that's uh, that that's key for us. We'll be one of the rare facilities that has not only an observatory, but a planetarium in the same place. Oftentimes, the planetaria are out in the middle of, uh, on top of a mountain someplace, not accessible or easily accessible to people. And the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the observatories are out on mountaintops and the planetaria are in cities where they can uh, reach many people. In our case, we're within reach of all those major cities. So we'll have both. Uh, it'll be a, a 24 hour uh, kind of a, an operation for us coming up and the, one of the reasons that you're here and that we're uh, learning more every day is because of the upcoming 2024 eclipse. We're calling it totality and Tupper. And we like to think that we're responsible for having this occur in the Adirondack Park. Um, it has been since I think the 13th century since the a, a total solar eclipse has passed over this region, over Tupper Lake, I should say, there has been, uh, there has been near misses or have been near misses. Um, and it won't be for another few hundred years till we get another total eclipse. Uh, of course, there's been some annulars and some partial eclipses, but for, uh, for totality, uh, it's been several hundred years and it will be another several hundred years until it happens again. And that's why we're talking about the great solar eclipse of 2024. And here to bring that to us, uh, is Gib Brown. But before we begin, I just want to make a uh, note that your microphones should be muted. We'll have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. And as always, our all of our presentations are available on YouTube. And this sometime within the next 24, 48 hours um, will, be, will be posted there on YouTube. So take a look for that. Um, and uh, feel free to visit us there at, at any time. You can see any of the previous lectures for the past few years. So without any further ado, um, I, I want to introduce our, our guest tonight, and that is a good friend of mine. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Gib is an award-winning teacher and meteorologist who's recently retired from NBC5 after 37 plus years. And during this long career, he also taught high school uh, science uh, at Peru and Osable Valley District, and has served as an adjunct professor of meteorology at, uh, at Clinton Community College and Plattsburgh SUNY. Gives an honorary chair of the regional science fair held annually in Plattsburgh. He's uh, also an, a, uh, an AMS emeritus member and is on the board of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. So when I say a good friend, He's, uh, he's one of our important players. We, we look to him for advice on weather frequently. Uh, during the winter season, Gibbs all, uh, also part-time uh, as an ambassador to the Olympic Regional Development Authority at Whiteface Mountain. 
Gibbs an avid skier, hiker, uh, most of all loves to travel and enjoys time, uh, spending time with his uh, Marilyn and his five grandkids, Catherine, Caden, Addison, Jack, and Ryan. So we are very pleased to have Gib uh, here with us tonight to talk about the great solar eclipse of 2024. So Gib, welcome and take it away. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, yeah, one of the things that we've had problem with over the course of the summer is that fires and the smoke that we've had here, I was out on the golf course the other day and there was a team that was playing next to me and they were in a tournament the previous weekend. They had to use orange golf balls so they could track their flight. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But anyway, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about the great solar eclipse because it is going to be great. Uh, I, there's no question about it. And if you've not caught the buzz yet, uh, I'm sure you will pretty soon because hotel rooms are getting really, really full. And as a matter of fact, the day of the eclipse, the prices of a hotel room have tripled over the past two or three weeks because I've been kind of checking things out there. And a lot of hotels are going to have special programs with the eclipse as well. But overall, uh, hotel rates have gone from 100 and change, uh, you know, off season is uh, April, uh, to where they're getting somewhere between three and four hundred dollars a room for the night of the eclipse. So it, it's just an amazing uh, facet here. And uh, that whole circle, that perimeter that um, Seth showed you a little while ago, we're going to have people from all over the place, Syracuse, Rochester, New York, Montreal, coming to our region, especially in Tupper Lake, to be right dead center uh, with that solar eclipse. So let's get to the program right now and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on. First of all, the great news is we are going to be top dead center. We are going to be uh, seeing the eclipse uh, at its maximal point. We're going to see um, about three and a half minutes of totality, which is very, very unusual. And uh, we're going to be right on that line there. So Tupper Lake, uh, not only the dark skies at night, but it's going to be the center of this uh, total, total eclipse. And uh, these things are rare. We're, we're going to be talking about how rare they are in a little bit, a little while. But overall, it's going to be an exciting event. Mark your calendars if you haven't already done so. It's April 8th, 2024. So first of all, we're going to talk about what an eclipse is anyway. And uh, I've gone to a couple of schools and in, interviewed a couple of kids. You might have to listen closely because the kids don't like to, they, in this case, didn't like to uh, voice themselves much. But again, Tupper Lake is top dead center. And uh, the purpose of what we're going to be doing tonight is talking about a few things. First of all, the science of an eclipse, um, and it's complicated. Uh, we're also going to take a look at some of the folklore and some misconceptions associated with an eclipse. And we're also going to show you how to safely observe this spectacular event uh, on April 8th of next uh, year. So overall, what is an eclipse anyway? Well, we've gone to a few schools, a couple of schools, and we've uh, interviewed some of the kids who actually are on board because they've had programs in their schools about the eclipse. So and I'm with some very smart students from the Plattsburgh City School District, and they're going to tell me all they need to know, or you, all you need to know, about the eclipse. So I'm going to start over here. Your name? Hadley. This is Hadley. So Hadley, what can you tell me about an eclipse? An eclipse is when the sun, the earth, and the moon all line up together, and there's only a little bit of sun showing through. Oh, okay. Very good. And your... These kids all have had a special day at school back in February, where they did a whole day dedicated to the upcoming eclipse. And it's when the sky is... Um, black for a few minutes. Oh, okay. And yeah. Um, an eclipse is a very big event that a lot of people come from different countries or states just to see. Okay. And my name is Marley. Okay. And? My name is Weston and a eclipse is a lot of people come from all different countries, like Marley said, yeah. and it's a big event that happens. Okay. No. Somebody can tell me what what makes an eclipse. Why does something go dark and something stay light? What what is an eclipse, Weston? It's when the sun, the moon, and the earth line up, and there's only one sliver of uh, sunlight peeking through. Okay. What causes that little glimmer of 
our door. Yeah. Okay. Um, the little glimmer, glimmer of light is because a li just a little bit of the sun is not lined up with the sun and the moon and okay. with the moon and the earth. So, so what, what causes the darkness? The sun, the moon, and the earth all line up together, and that's what causes the darkness. Okay. Um, do you know something about a shadow? Yeah. God bless me. What's a sh what 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 causes the shadow? Uh, a shadow is when like if you have a light pointing towards you, mm -hmm. you're like say you're standing right here. The light is facing towards that way because you're covering the space and it doesn't show uh -huh. over there. And then it just turns into a little black. So the, so the lights get blocked. Yeah. Yeah. And does that cause the eclipse? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Saranac schools, and he's going to tell us what his impression of a solar eclipse happens to be. Jimmy? So a solar eclipse is when a moon blocks the sun's light from showing on the earth and usually in the daytime. Yeah. So to summarize very quickly, uh, we've got two kinds of eclipses. That's when one heavenly body, such as a moon or planet, moves into the shadow of another heavenly body. So the two types, of course, are solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. Now, basically, graphically, a solar eclipse occurs when the moon's shadow is cast on the Earth. And uh, when we look at a lunar uh, uh, lunar eclipse, it is the Earth's shadow cast on the moon. So the bottom line is it's a basically a shadowing effect, and eclipses occur, and they are fairly uh, rare. Now, um, of course, the, what type of eclipse is most common, of course, it is the lunar eclipse because the Earth is larger and it casts a larger shadow, and therefore there's a better chance of seeing a lunar eclipse than a solar eclipse. But it gets very, very complicated when you get past that point. Um, if you take a stick or you take a ball and a light and you create a shadow, you'll see, it's this graphic shows you, uh, there are two different types of shadow. One is a completely dark part, uh, which we call the umbra, and then the partial shadow around that, uh, which is what we call the penumbra. So if you put the earth in the way and we put the moon on the backside, uh, you'll see that we have the, the moon currently in the middle on an umbra position. That is a total lunar eclipse. But when it's in the penumbra phase, we call that a partial eclipse. And those, this is what causes the, the two major kinds of eclipses that we have. Now, uh, the lighter part, again, uh, is the partial eclipse, the darker part is the total eclipse. Now, again, uh, when we see a total eclipse of either the sun or the moon, we are in the umbra of the shadow. So that's the darkest part of the shadow. Now, uh, one of the interesting things is, of course, that you know eclipses have been around a long time and there's been a lot of folklore. And one of the most interesting uh, captions that I can find is way back in the uh, Chinese record, some 4,000 years ago, in China, one of the earliest words for an eclipse is rishi, which means eat the sun in Chinese. Now, it was commonly held that there were dragons out there, and the eclipse occurred when the celestial dragon was attacked and devoured, uh, devoured the sun. So overall, they used to be very frightened of that, of course, and uh, they tried to frighten the dragon away by beating drums, making loud noises, even shooting arrows in the air uh, during a solar eclipse. Again, a very, very frightening thing. So overall, back to the science, um, why is a solar eclipse so rare? Well, it's a complicated system. First of all, uh, there's an amazing coincidence. And uh, this coincidence uh, is got to do with what we call the angular diameter. Now, the angular diameter is the way you see something with respect to a distance. And uh, let our kids once again uh, examine this for us. Okay, and so I've got a experimenting with a ball a and a, a much larger ball. How can you make these the same size or look the same size? Go ahead. Maybe you could take the little ball and you could fill it with air, or you can take the big ball and deflate it. That would be one way of doing it. Okay, suppose this was a ball, say, like the size of the Earth. How could you do that? What do you think? Um, you could put the big ball like farther away oh. than the 
little ball? Let's see if that will work, shall we? I want you to take the ball and hold it out in front of you. Come around this way. There you go. And would you, with a great idea, I want you to walk that way. Move over this way just a little bit. I want you to walk that way, and I want you to keep that ball right in front of your face until the big ball looks the same size. Go ahead. Hold the ball so she can see it. There you go. So she, does it look like the same size? Oh, wow. That was brilliant. It's a that brilliant, brilliant idea. Huh? I said it's, it's a brilliant, a brilliant idea. idea. <laughs> So anyway, the sun is about 400 times larger than the moon, but the moon is 400 times closer to the earth than the sun. The bottom line is they have about the same angular diameter in, in terms of degrees and all that. It's about a half a degree in size, and uh, they're very, very close to that uh, most of the time. So overall, uh, that is quite a coincidence that allows that to happen. But beyond that, there are some other reasons. First of all, if the moon orbits the earth, then why don't we have an eclipse every single month? Well, again, that's a complicated thing. First of all, um, the orbit of the moon going around the earth compared to the plane of the ecliptic is slightly tilted. It's about five degrees off that line. Um, why is that the case? Well, the moon was probably formed as a collision between our planet and another planet and yada, 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 we, we had a, a, a ring around the earth for a while, then that it coalesced into the moon. The bottom line is it gave the moon, which, which coalesced into a, a solid body, an orbit that is slightly off kilter. And so that is one of the reasons why we, we, we don't see a moon, uh, an eclipse every single cycle. The other, uh, and again, because most of the time, um, the shadow misses um, one or the other, the moon or the earth, depending on the eclipse. So the only time you can actually see a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse is to have the lineup absolutely perfect. Now, the second thing is that the moon's orbit is, is not completely circular. It's an elliptical orbit. Now, this is a very highly exaggerated um, orbit right here, or diagram right here, but this appears uh, this allows the moon to be larger at some points, uh, appearance-wise, and smaller that other, uh, at others. Uh, the closest point is called a perigee, and the furthest what point furthest away is called an apogee. If it refers to the Earth and the moon, we call it perihelion and aphelion. But the bottom line is, sometimes the moon's shadow doesn't even reach the Earth because it's just a little bit too far away. And of course, this occurs uh, when the moon is at an apogee. Now, it, the interesting thing about today is that the Earth's orbit going around the sun, of course, is also an ellipse. And we today, June, uh, July 6th, we are actually farther away from the sun than at any other point during the year, again, because of the elliptical orbit of the Earth. So overall, um, this, occur this occurs, um, the, the frequency is caused not only by the size and the um, position of the planets, Earth, Earth, Moon, and Sun, but at any point on average, um, no more than one solar eclipse can occur in three to four centuries at one particular location. So in other words, the, the chance of Tupper Lake having another eclipse right overhead is you know, sometime between three and 400 years from now. So probably, beyond our lifetimes, at least. Um, as, meant, as Seth mentioned, we had one back in the, I guess, 13th century. So again, it's, it's a very, very rare event. The situation is very different for lunar eclipses. Um, we could see on average of approximately one per year, about 19 or 20 lunar eclipses in about 18 years. So um, that is a much more common uh, episode. And of course, a lunar eclipse can last a lot longer because, again, it's in the larger Earth's shadow. They can last anywhere from an hour and up to an hour and three quarters. A solar eclipse, however, uh, will only uh, a, a last for approximately uh, seven and a half minutes at the absolute longest. So to see this eclipse coming our way, uh, the probability of about three and a half minutes is, is pretty outstanding. So to summarize, the uh, tilted orbit uh, and the elliptical orbit are the reason why a solar eclipse is so rare. 
Now, we also have a lot of folklore of it, and some of it's kind of cute. Um, in the West African nation of Benin, we switched the gender roles, uh, sun being female now and the moon being male, and um, they suggest the orbs are very, very busy, but when they do get together, they turn off the lights for privacy. I thought that was pretty cute. Anyway, we do have a lot of uh, superstitions and misconceptions, and so uh, I wanna go through some of these uh, with you right now. Uh, people still fear them. Uh, back years ago when I was teaching at uh, one of the schools, um, we were getting ready to see an eclipse and we had kids making shadow boxes and things like that. And 15 minutes before the eclipse occurred, principal came out and said, you can't go out there. We've had calls from parents saying that it's a very dangerous thing to um, be out during a solar eclipse. And I had to bring all of my students back inside for about 10 minutes until I finally calm things down and we were able to get out there and, and see the eclipse. Um, it, it, there's a mis misconception that um, the eclipses are dangerous to pregnant women and unborn children. Um, in a lot of cultures, they ask people, women, especially if they're pregnant, to stay indoors during a solar eclipse. Modern baby blogs ask pregnant women to wear some kind of metal, such as a safety pin, to protect the baby, I have no idea why. And in many parts of India, people fast during a solar eclipse due to the belief that any food cooked while the eclipse happens will be poisonous and unpure. There is absolutely no scientific basis to support any of this. Um, if we look at the eclipses, uh, we do uh, know that eclipses, when they're at totality, have really no problem at all being viewed, but it's when you are watching the watching before and just after the totality, if you catch a, a, a glimpse of a brilliant solar surface, uh, you can have, uh, it can cause retinal damage. Um, but again, it's not a big thing if you are looking at it during the totality. Um, if you're pregnant, uh, the harmful radiations that are supposedly emitted are, are really harmless. Uh, any electromagnetic radiation from uh, the atmosphere of the sun uh, that gets around, uh, it's, it's basically uh, light and it's perfectly safe. Um, who that is prepared, there's no scientific um, reason for any of that to be spoiled. Um, you know, people have had accidentally um, They've had a food spoiled because they kind of left the potato salad out of the refrigerator for a period of time during an eclipse party. That might make you sick, but the eclipse itself did not make it was, uh, would not make people sick. Um, they're not harbingers of bad things about to happen, although that's one of the things uh, that many of our records show our, our ancestors believe. Um, they think that uh, eclipses uh, uh, show something uh, foreboding and um, uh, something you know likely bad will happen. And again, solar eclipses six months after your birthday or on your birthday are a sign of impending bad health. Uh, again, this is definitely uh, just uh, misinformation. Uh, there's no confirmation of that at all. There's no relationship between a totally solar, total solar eclipse and your health, any more than there is a relationship between your health and a new moon. So but there are, some of the superstitions that we've had really are not all negative. For example, in Italy, it's believed that flowers that are planted during a solar eclipse are brighter and more colorful than flowers planted at any other time of year. And in Bohemia, miners believe that the event portended a, a good luck in finding gold. So again, some of those superstitions are not doom and gloom at all. So what will we experience during a solar eclipse? Well, I think, for this solar eclipse, um, depending on how the weather works, uh, we have a great opportunity for discovery and experimentation. So teachers and parents, you could have your students check out things like how, do you, how does the eclipse affect temperature, humidity, pressure, and wind? Um, there is a likelihood that we do have an effect. In some cases, uh, we've noticed a, a, a very sharp temperature drop, for example. So that might be one really exciting classroom opportunity. How do birds react to the darkness? Uh, do they go back to their nests? Do they fly around? Do they you know, observe that uh, solar eclipse in any sp specific way? Um, animal behavior, horses, whatever, um, rabbits, uh, squirrels, do they change their behavior in any way? 
do fish bite more often during the eclipse. I've heard some interesting stories about that one, by the way. And then do farm animals begin performing nighttime rituals like grooming, sleeping, or eating? These are some of the things that uh, it might be fun to experience and to investigate uh, during the solar eclipse in April next year. Now, again, uh, solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes directly in front of the sun. And a lot of times you'll get a beautiful view of the solar atmosphere, the sun's outer atmosphere or corona. And uh, we've had varieties of colors from green to, to pink noticed before. And um, you can see a lot of the towering structures of material uh, that are suspended above the sun's surface by magnetic field. So basically, if you uh, see what um, uh, th this image was taken in Australia during the, the Australian eclipse, uh, you'll see what we call coronal uh, streamers, and you'll see the solar prominences as well. So uh, sometimes these can be pretty large. It depends on the timing. So again, uh, this is a, a NASA uh, animation of one of the eclipses. So uh, as you can see, the moon is crossing in front of the sun. This, of course, is a new moon position. And when it crosses in front, things get dark and you get a bit of a diamond ring effect. You get a flash of light as uh, the, the moon just gets in front of the sun and then starts to leave. So overall, uh, that's a pretty uh, a neat thing to see. But again, you never, ever, ever want to look directly at the sun during the solar eclipse, whether it's in totality or whether it's ongoing. So overall, there are safe ways to do it. So um, in the, the, the actual eclipse itself, uh, there is nothing to fear, but before and after, um, there could be retinal damage because of the brilliant uh, solar uh, solar light. So um, you can, again, cause retinal damage. And it's really best to observe a solar eclipse with approved safety uh, methods. So the best methods that we have are, of course, the solar eclipse glasses. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, pinhole projectors. Um, we have, that's the, probably the safest way and the cheapest way to view a solar eclipse. And then we have welder's glasses and there are other ways as well. Now, a safe solar viewer, um, it has got to be um, certified and um, it has to reduce the sun's visible light to a comfortable brightness level. And the only way you can tell is um, that there is an ISO rating, uh, the number that you can see there, and that suits the safety standards. And the only way that you're gonna know that's certain is that if it comes from a reputable vendor. So overall, uh, we've had all kinds of people uh, give us all kinds of ideas about how to look at a solar eclipse. People have looked at neutral density or polarizing filters, uh, like made for camera lenses, smoke glass, photographic glass, X-ray film, space blankets, even potato chip bags, and DVDs held up to the sun. They are not safe. None of the stuff is safe. Um, what you wanna do is get some approved solar glasses. And those glasses have to meet ISO requirements. And um, they are, again, international safety standards. And if you purchase safety goggles, you will see this requirement and the ISO ratings in the inside of the, um, the frame. And so again, uh, it should say they're safe for solar viewing and it meets these sort of requirements. However, um, you can't guarantee that just because there's an ISO reading on the glasses, it, it doesn't necessarily mean they are safe because there are a lot of unscrupulous manufacturers that will put out a really cheap product, put in a, a bogus ISO number inside the glasses and uh, those glasses aren't worth anything at all and they could cause uh, blindness. Uh, the other thing is if the filters are torn or scratched or punctured, you just wanna get rid of them. Um, if the filters come loose from their frames, just get rid of them as well. Now, in terms of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, uh, we will have glasses available um, and they are going to be uh, the certified glasses. Price per pair, is right now $3 uh, per pair. Um, larger quantities, there'll be a lower price, I'm told. Um, but again, 
as time gets closer, uh, prices of these glasses will increase. So if you go to the AdirondackSkyCenter.org and go to order Eclipse glasses, um, you will be able to get to the site where uh, the ASCNO are selling these glasses. You can order them by mail at the Adirondack Sky Center, Box 1332, Tupper Lake. Um, and um, uh, they will certainly get to you as quickly as we can. And um, another thing, if you go to the AdirondackSkyCenter.org site, um, there is a great uh, countdown clock to the eclipse. And if you go to logwork.com countdown and you see the letters there, you will um, see the countdown to the eclipse to the nearest second. So um, that's kind of a neat thing to go check out. So I uh, would encourage you to do that. Now, the other thing that uh, other way of watching uh, eclipses that uh, solar eclipse is safe is through a pinhole projector. And um, basically it, it mounts to be a piece of a hole in, a, in an index card and um, you allow the sunlight to go through the hole and onto a second card, a couple of feet in front of it. And that will give you a little bright spot of light and you'll be able to watch the eclipse progress on that little bright spot of light without turning around and looking at the sun. Another projection idea is to take a telescope or binoculars and point that to the sun, but don't look through it and then have the image go on a piece of uh, cardboard and uh, it'll be magnified and you'll see a very nice image of the solar eclipse that way, again, without looking directly at the sun. Um, pinhole cameras are a lot of fun to make. Uh, basically you need some aluminum foil, a um, pair of scissors, maybe a hole punch and some kind of a box perhaps. Um, a cereal box works just fine. And you take one of the sides of the top of the box and you put the aluminum foil over it and you punch a little hole and then leave the other side open so you can look down inside the box to the darker section of the box and the light from the sun will go through that little pinhole down to the bottom of the box and you'll be able to look at it very, very nicely that way. So overall, uh, it's called Camera Obscura and uh, it's a really nice way of viewing the eclipse. Uh, in my classes, we made uh, all kinds of boxes and we decorated them and we had large and small and we had awards and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. So, but all the kids were um, encouraged to look directly into those boxes and not at the sun itself. So overall, um, that is the, probably the safest way, but um, even safer um, is would, would be to join us at fun, at Totality in Tupper, and that's at the park in Tupper Lake. It is going to be a fantastic event. It's gonna start on Sunday, the day before the eclipse on April 7th. In the morning, we're gonna be doing things like modeling eclipses, um, showing you how to solar image. Serial box viewers will be done that way. We'll be making them there. Um, be uh, looking at other activities as well, measuring energy, um, and again, later in the afternoon and evening, music in the park and to be finished off with a nine o'clock fireworks display at the municipal park. Now, the day of the eclipse on Monday, uh, there are many other activities as well. And some of them are here for you, but um, how can the little moon hide the giant sun is one. We're gonna do a thing on solar imaging. Uh, we're gonna do a beach ball demonstration involving angular diameter. Uh, a guest speaker. Uh, we're not sure who that's going to be just yet, but I, I'm hearing some interesting uh, scuttlebutt. Um, and we're going to be doing serial box viewers and measuring the effect of the eclipse on the ionosphere. And as the eclipse occurs, there is going to be a 36 foot screen um, of, of a broadcast of NASA's live stream as the eclipse passes through Terryville, Texas. Um, and then the Adirondack Sky Center is being considered as a possible fourth site for NASA's live stream broadcast. So that's very, very exciting. Uh, I'm not sure where that stands right now, but um, it is something to look forward to. And then of course, after the eclipse, more music and more fireworks. So it's gonna be an exciting time in, in uh, Tupper Lake and I, I hope everybody can get here. It's gonna be a great day for sure. Get great couple days uh, at Totality in Tupper.
Um, so hopefully, um, April 8th, 2024 is going to be a bright and sunny day. Don't hold me to the percentage for clouds on the 8th. Um, I tend to be optimistic, um, but I'm hoping that we have clear skies and we also have comfortable temperatures for April 8th. So overall, um, we have, uh, I guess, questions. And so uh, I'd like to uh, take this time to thank you for listening and uh, try to entertain any questions that you might have. Great, Gib. Thanks so much. That was a, a ton of information, uh, absolute ton of information. And I should add that uh, even if the uh, sky is cloudy, uh, being part of a, a total solar eclipse in a cloudy area is still a spectacular event. Uh, it, it will still get dark. The sun still uh, gets obscured by the moon and uh, it, it will get dark as night. So even though we don't see the beauty of the corona, um, that shadow uh, of the uh, moon moving across the clouds is uh, very spectacular, a little scary too. So uh, with that, why don't we open it up for some questions. If, uh, if you've got a question, uh, you can feel free to unmute your microphone and, uh, and, and ask directly. I wear um, glasses. I'm nearsighted. Mm -hmm. How do eclipse glasses wear work with uh, eyeglasses, spectacles? I believe they should just go over the top of the glasses. So, what do you view? What do you normally wear? The eclipse glasses will filter out anything that's harmful, even around the edges of my because they're going to be held. It's going to be held away from my eyes by the uh, by the frames of the glasses. You know, it would be a good idea. I would ask your, your local doctor about okay. that. But that might you. be the safest way to do it. Thanks. Okay. We have a question about uh, uh, from Randall. Uh, I assume a ton of people will be heading to the Adirondacks on the 8th. Any oh, yeah. rec recommendations on when to leave uh, from the Albany area specifically? Um, we, you know, we're trying to, uh, in, in Tupper Lake, our community is planning a, a come early, stay late uh, kind of an event. So um, there may actually not be any place to stay in Tupper Lake anymore or in Saranac Lake or Lake Placid at this point. Um, when to leave is a, a valid question. Uh, the earlier, the better. Um, in Tupper Lake, totality begins. Uh, well, the partial eclipse, the first point of contact of the moon across the sun is at 2.12 p.m. So certainly you want to be uh, stationed, ready to go. Uh, at that point, if you were to leave at five o'clock in the morning uh, and, and arrive here several hours in advance, A, there's going to be plenty to do. There's plenty of activities that we're planning for that day. And B, you're more, uh, less likely to encounter traffic jams as you get closer to Tupper Lake. So earlier is better, I would say. And uh, getting home is a whole other question. Um, I traveled from Lexington, Kentucky to, uh, um, uh, uh, geez, just coming up short of the name, a, a three hour trip uh, to get to, um, um, to the eclipse in 2017, but it took 11 hours to get back. So, uh, and that's because people, as soon as the eclipse ends, the, all of the engines start. And, uh, you know, so every, th that's when the traffic jam, people trickle in, but they all leave at the same time. Um, so that's why we're, we're gonna provide some entertainment after the eclipse. Uh, hopefully you stay around, let some of that traffic dissipate before you head home. But I would plan on a long day. It, it'll be early in the morning, leave as early as you can. And uh, the eclipse, the partial ends at 436 here in Tupper Lake. So that would be the earliest you would be uh, uh, getting, getting able to leave. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, another question, what's the swath of coverage of the eclipse north and south of the central focal area? Uh, the line of totality where Tupper is, uh, estimated time of eclipse uh, if in Plattsburgh or Burlington are very different. I can speak to that, uh, Gib, in Tupper Lake specifically. Uh, the, it, the, the swath is about 115 miles wide. So from the south edge of the totality to the north, it's about 115 miles. 
Uh, it's traveling a couple thousand miles an hour. So, uh, you know, you got to kind of keep that into account. Our partial, as I uh, mentioned, begins at, um, you know what, I can actually paste this right into the, the chat. The partial begins at 212. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the totality begins at um, at 324. So unlike the animations that we see from NASA and other, you know, where it, it, the moon moves right across, it creeps across. It happens very slowly. And that's why the totality is spectacular for three minutes and 33 seconds um, in Tupper Lake. So uh, the, the total ends at 327 and 57 seconds. That's three minutes and 33 seconds after it begins at 324 and 25 seconds. And the last point of contact is at 436 and 16 seconds. And you're absolutely right in saying that uh, it goes, uh, it, it's different um, depending on where you are. Even in Tupper Lake, uh, there are places where it is uh, three minutes and 31 seconds or three minutes and 34 seconds, depending on which end of town you're at, uh, north or south. So um the, there's there's a lot um so anyway i hope that answers your question yeah there'll, there'll, there's going to be an awful lot of people coming up to this i mean if you talk to any of the hotel people not managers around uh they are getting swamped as of now i can't imagine what it's going to be like in january february right i'm going to put a um a, another link in to the chat um, this is uh, uh, an interactive Google map uh, uh, created by uh, just a, a fantastic uh, guy, Xavier uh, Jubier, maybe I, I can't remember his name exactly, but that uh, by using that map, um, you'll be able to really, you can hover over the specific place that you are and it'll show you exactly where uh, and how long all of the details of uh, uh of the timing of the eclipse on that google map so take a look at that and uh and enjoy more questions all right well with that then i i want to say uh thanks again to gib uh, he's a tremendous resource for us at the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. Uh, we're glad he's retired. Uh, we want him to stop traveling so darn much. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry uh, about the technical problems that we had at the very beginning there. I, uh, I, that, that's all right. And in fact, when uh, the video goes up, that'll all be edited out. So it'll be one smooth uh, presentation like it never even happened. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. So uh, with that, I, I wanna thank everybody for coming. We'll do another one of these uh, Cygnus Lecture Series happens on the first Thursday of each month at, uh, at seven o'clock and we'll send out a registration for the next one uh, that, uh, that is lined up. And I think I'll be doing that one and that will be likely on, uh, uh, again, Eclipse related um, because we're really, you know, this is Eclipse Central, Tupper Lake and the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory. We are Eclipse Central. Uh, this is this is what we've been waiting for our whole lives. The greatest celestial event to happen to us uh, since sliced bread. So uh, with that, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. Uh, and thank you, Gib, very much. I appreciate you, your, your time and, and, and energy here. So it's been a lot of fun. All right. Good night, everybody. We'll see you soon. Good night.